Good morning, everyone. My name's Lucia Kutsakreya, and I'm the marketing executive for EQS Group in the UK, where we provide a range of digital compliance solutions to organizations of all sizes. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, um, which will cover the transposition of the European Whistleblowing Directive into Irish law and what your company needs to do to comply with this law. So I'm very pleased to be joined by three legal experts from ANL Goodbody. Uh, we have um, Michael Doyle, Clara Gleason, and Trina Sugru. Welcome to you all, and thanks for joining us. And I'll hand over to you shortly to give a short introduction about yourself. So we have a lot to cover over the next hour, but we've left sufficient time at the end to cover any audience questions. So during the uh, discussion, if any questions come to mind, please put them into the panel that is now highlighted on your screen. So you can ask any questions throughout the presentation. So I will now hand over for some short introductions. Uh, so Trina, over to you first, please. Thanks, Lucia. Um, my name is Trina Sugru, and I am a knowledge lawyer with the Employment Practice Group at a and Goodbody. Thanks, Trina. Good morning, all. My name is Michael Doyle, and I'm an employment partner on the employment team at a and Goodbody, and I have considerable experience of advising employers on uh, drafting whistleblowing policies, dealing with whistleblowing reports, and also dealing with the litigation that whistleblowers sometimes bring. Thanks, Michael. My name is Clara Gleeson. I'm an associate in ANL Goodbody's White Collar Crime Group, where I regularly advise clients, both corporates and individuals, on internal and external investigations, often involving whistleblowers and related issues. Perfect. Thank you all for those introductions. Again, just the audience remembers uh, to put any questions in into the Q&A panel throughout this discussion. But for now, Michael, I will hand back over to you. Great. Thanks, Lucia, um, and nice to be speaking with you all this morning. So first things first, while the Protected Disclosures Amendment Act has been signed into law by the Irish President, it has yet to be commenced. And we here at ANL Goodbody have been hounding the department for an update on when exactly the act is going to be commenced. And the latest update we have is that the act is going to be commenced in phases in the autumn. And it seems the rationale for commencing the act in phases is that employers who don't yet have internal reporting channels established do need to get their house in order. And also, I think there is an acknowledged um, uh, workload on the part of government departments establishing the Office of the Protected Disclosures Commissioner. And I think that is also no doubt impacting the timing of the enactment of the full act. So the key takeaway for this part of the session is if you haven't got up to your speed uh, on your obligations yet under the new regime or indeed rolled out a new policy, well, there is time to do so. But I do think it's fair to say we're in overtime. So it would be uh, prudent to prioritise your action plan on this front over the coming weeks. And we do hope, obviously, after today that you guys will have a very good sense of what the new regime means for your business and indeed what steps you should be taking now. So before jumping into some of the key developments of the new regime, I just wanted to spend a moment or two tracing the evolution of the new Act. Of course, the genesis of the new Act is the EU whistleblowing directive from 2019, and Ireland had two years within which to amend its existing legislation, the Protected Disclosures Act from 2014, to implement the directive, but that time period ran out in December 2021. I think it's fair to say that uh, Ireland wasn't an outlier uh, in that it missed the implementation deadline, but so too did many other member states. And indeed, as things stand, I think there's 16 EU member states that have yet to enact local law to implement the directive. The general scheme of the Protected Disclosures Amendment Bill was published in May 2021, and the bill itself was actually only published in February this year. It had a pretty smooth transition through the legislative process with the bill ultimately being signed into law by the president at the end of July. My colleagues, Clara and Trina, who you've now met, are going to dive into the detail of the new act shortly. But before I hand over to them, I do want to just touch on what I consider to be some of the noteworthy aspects of the new act that I think have been overlooked perhaps somewhat in some of the recent commentary on the act, in particular in the media. So first, it's essential that you're all aware that the definition of worker has been expanded quite significantly and the following individuals can now make protected disclosures. Volunteers, shareholders, board members, and even job applicants. 
And the latter category in particular is certainly one to watch out for in that not only can job applicants now make disclosures and benefit from the applicable statutory protections, but they can also pursue statutory redress by bringing claims to the Workplace Relations Commission. And if they're successful, they could be awarded compensation up to 15,000 euro. So then turning to the million dollar question these days, well, what exactly is a protected disclosure in light of the new act? Well, the definition is on the slide, as you can see there. Under the new act, a protected disclosure is a disclosure of relevant information, which in the reasonable belief of the worker tends to show one or more relevant wrongdoings. And it came to the attention of the worker in a work related context. So in relation to the relevant wrongdoings, the eight wrongdoings that are specified in the 2014 Act remain. However, they are going to be expanded upon to cover breaches of EU law in a wide range of areas over which the EU has uh, competency, such as public procurement, prevention of money laundering, and indeed protection of personal data. In relation to the work-related context, this replaces the current wording, which is in connection with the worker's employment. And this is a broader definition and includes both current and past work activities. From my own perspective, in advising clients for many years on this particular topic, I've always advised clients that a protected disclosure isn't necessarily what you think it is. It's often much more mundane than that. I think when people think of whistleblowers, they tend to think about the likes of Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden and even um, Jeffrey Wigand, who Russell Crowe played in the movie The Insider. Uh, in all those cases, the individuals were, from their perspective, exposing wrongdoing that could affect huge numbers of people around the world. I think very few employers tend to think about a butcher complaining to their employer about back pain and that individual also constituting a whistleblower. And that was the exact scenario in the very recent Supreme Court decision in Barania be Ross Dara Irish Meats that Trina is going to discuss with you shortly. The net is very wide when it comes to matters on which employees in particular can make whistleblowing reports. By way of example, in a very recent case before the Workplace Relations Commission, a teacher was awarded €40,000 in compensation for penalisation for having made a protected disclosure about a school's alleged breach of Irish copyright law in making copies of a book available to students without the permission of the publisher of the particular book. In our experience, a trap that some employers often fall into is that they assume that there's some obligation to make a report in writing and to highlight it as a whistleblowing report or to label it a protected disclosure. Of course, there isn't any requirement to do so. As the Act makes crystal clear, whistleblowing reports can be made orally or in writing or indeed both. From our perspective, one of the main reasons why we recommend all employers have a whistleblowing policy, even if they're not obliged by law to have one, is to encourage employees to make reports in writing under that particular policy. And in that way, it puts the employer in the best possible position to identify protected disclosures at the earliest possible opportunity. And it also ensures that employees who do make reports aren't subjected to adverse treatment that could subsequently be found to be penalization. Under the new act, there are very prescriptive record keeping requirements in particular for oral reports. And where oral reports are made, but not audio recorded, you do actually need to take notes of the report and then get the whistleblower sign off on the notes before taking matters any further. Trina and Clara are going to touch on a few other traps for the unwary, as we call them, when dealing with reports during their presentations. So on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Trina, who's going to kick off the discussion by examining if a grievance can ever be a protected disclosure. Trina, I think uh, we might have a problem with your microphone, just to flag. Is that working? I hope so. Yeah, perfect. Um, great. Sorry. So in terms of looking at whether a, the, a workplace grievance can be a protective disclosure, it's noteworthy that in the Irish legislation, there's no requirement that the disclosure is in the public interest. So in the Irish legislation, there's a list of relevant wrongdoings and have now these have now been expanded to take account of the EU directive. So there's nine relevant wrongdoings. And one of these can be that the breach of a legal obligation other than one arising under the workers' contract of employment. And another one is a breach of health and safety law. And last year, as Michael mentioned, there was a significant Supreme Court decision in Ireland. It's called Barania and Ross Dera Meath. 
And in that decision, the Supreme Court determined that under Ireland's legislation, the existing legislation that we've had up until now, a complaint of a failure to comply with a legal obligation that is personal to an employee can qualify as a protected disclosure. And this is in contrast with the EU whistleblowing directive, which references whistleblowers as those who report illegal situations which are harmful to the public interest element. So the Supreme Court determined that there was no public interest element required. And in fact, it can be a purely personal complaint. And in that case, it's related to an employee alleging that he was suffering from back pain. So the new act endeavours, in Ireland's new legislation, endeavours to address this apparent inconsistency by excluding from relevant wrongdoing interpersonal grievances or complaints which exclusively affect the reporting person. So if there is a matter concerning an interpersonal grievance exclusively affecting the reporting person, so grievances about interpersonal conflicts, these are excluded, and that's an option under the directive. But it also has wording that says that a matter concerning a complaint by a reporting person to or about their employer, which concerns them exclusively, is not a protected disclosure. However, this presents a challenge for businesses in terms of triaging complaints and deciding whether they are more appropriately dealt with under a grievance process or whether they should be, in fact, processed as a protected disclosure. So it's a, a disclosure that is made by an employee that their own personal health and safety can be a protected disclosure, and that's because the wording is that it's the health and safety of any individual. And it's worth remembering that bullying uh, can be an endangerment to health and safety. So a complaint about bullying can be a protected disclosure that an employee is bullied, being bullied. And also, it's very easy to avoid an exclusivity requirement. If a complaint in any way relates to anybody else, it won't be exclusive to the worker. So a lot of complaints will fall under the definition of a protected disclosure under Ireland's regime. the most pressing requirement of the new regime will be the internal reporting channels and procedures. So a key change for employers will be this requirement to have their own internal reporting channel and procedure. As things stand in Ireland, only public sector employers are obliged to have such procedures in place. And so initially, when the Act is commenced, this will apply to employers with 250 or more employees. And then from 17th of December 2023, which is not that far away, all employers with 50 or more employees will have to have these internal challenges and procedures in place. And these thresholds don't apply where the employer falls within the scope of EU laws in areas such as financial services. The rationale for having such local channels is that it is vital that the relevant information reaches swiftly those closest to the source of the problem, who are most able to investigate, and with the powers to remedy it where possible. So encouraging internal reporting at local level. So looking at the principles of these new, um, these new reporting channels and procedures, they may be operated internally or provided externally by a third party. In either case, it will be very important that the internal person or department or external third party has the necessary skills and competence to perform the function and has undertaken appropriate training. The channels need to be secure, so they must be designed, established and operated in a secure manner. This must protect the confidentiality of the identity of the reporting person and any third party mentioned and prevent the access by non-authorised persons. And lastly there on the slide is that information must be provided by employers in a clear and accessible manner. So the information must include the procedures for making a protected disclosure using the internal reporting channel. In relation to anonymous reports, the conditions under which such reports may be accepted and follow-up undertaken, and also the procedures for making a protected disclosure to a prescribed person or the Office of the Protected Disclosures Commissioner. And Clara is going to speak in more detail about these routes and also the topic of anonymous disclosures. basic step plan covering the procedures. The first requirement is that receipt of the protected disclosure is acknowledged within seven days. 
Secondly, the, a design, an impartial person must be designated, person or persons who are competent to follow up on reports, and that may be the same person as the recipient. They will maintain communication with the reporting person and where necessary will request further information from and provide feedback to the reporting person. Thirdly, there should be diligent follow-up by the designated person, which under the Irish legislation necessitates at least the following steps. So the carrying out of an initial assessment to assess whether there is a prima facie or apparent evidence that a relevant wrongdoing may have occurred. If after that initial assessment, the designated person decides there is no prima facie evidence that a relevant wrongdoing may have occurred, they may close the procedure or refer the matter to another applicable procedure. So, for example, the grievance procedure. Uh, but they must notify the reporting person in writing as soon as practicable of the decision and the reasons for it. If they do decide that there is prima facie evidence, then they have to uh, take the appropriate steps to address it and to address the relevant wrongdoing. Fourthly, there on the slide is a reasonable time frame for the provision of feedback. This should not exceed three months from the acknowledgement or if no acknowledgement was sent, not more than three months from death, seven days after the report was made. And the Irish legislation also contains a requirement that a reporting person may request in writing the provision of ongoing feedback. So very often the matter won't be done and dusted within three months and they may request ongoing feedback and that feedback must be given at intervals of three months until the procedure relating to the report is closed. Moving on to an area of significant reform under the, under the Irish regime is the area of penalisation. Uh, the directive uses the term retaliation and the Irish legislation uses the, penal, the term penalisation, which they're using to mean the same thing as retaliation. So penalisation under our Ireland's regime up until now was defined as any act or omission that affects a worker to the worker's detriment. But the new regime will mimic the wording in the directive, which is any direct or indirect act or omission which occurs in a work-related context, is prompted by the making of a report and causes or may cause unjustified detriment to a worker. In the Irish legislation, it includes examples and they are the same existing examples, which are suspension, things like suspension, layoff, dismissal. But there's also new examples, such as a negative performance assessment, failure to convert a temporary employment contract to a permanent one, and even a medical referral could constitute penalisation or retaliation. The Act also raises the bar for employers when it comes to defending a penalisation claim, so that where an employee brings a penalisation claim, the Act provides that it will be deemed to have been a, as a result of the employee having made a protected closure unless the employer proves that the act or omission concerned was based on duly justified grounds. So this is a reversal of the burden of proof in the Irish legislation, putting the burden of proof onto the employer. And that accords with the requirements of the EU whistleblowing directive. This bar is likely to be relatively high bar in practice, so if employers are not in a position to point to objective factors in support of decisions they make, they are likely to struggle to shift the burden of proof back to the employee. So it will be interesting to see how that plays out in practice once the first penalisation claims start to happen. In terms of redress for an employee who is successful in a penalisation claim, under the Irish legislation, they can be awarded up to five years remuneration, or if they are a job uh, applicant, this is capped at €15,000 uh, uh, as compensation. There is also a significant new avenue of redress for uh, um, an employee who claims they have been penalised. They not only could bring a claim to Ireland's Workplace Relations Commission, they have the option of applying to the circuit court within 21 days following the last instance of penalisation for interim relief or injunctive relief to restrain the alleged act of penalisation. Up until now in Ireland, that avenue was only available in respect of employees where they're being dismissed, not in relation to all forms of penalisation. So that will be another route that employees can take once that is commenced. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Clara, and Clara is going to cover some of the very important uh, issues, such as the duty to protect to protect a whistleblower's identity, the topic of anonymous disclosures and making disclosures to external bodies. 
Thanks very much, Trina. So under the current regime, one of the biggest challenges for businesses managing and investigating protected disclosures, both practically and in terms of fair procedures, is avoiding falling foul of the duty of confidentiality to protect the identity of the whistleblower. The new act preserves this existing requirement. The wording has been slightly reformulated, but the substantive duty has not been meaningfully amended. Similar to the existing requirement, the duty of confidentiality in the act extends not just to protecting the actual identity of the reporting person or the whistleblower, but also to any information from which their identity may be directly or indirectly deduced. So now let's look at what really has changed in this area. Importantly, what is new is that the Act provides for new forms of penalties and redress for breach of the duty to protect the whistleblower's identity. First, it creates a new criminal offence which will apply to any person, and that includes a company, that breaches the duty of confidentiality. The proposed penalties are quite significant, a fine of up to €75,000 and, for individuals, up to two years imprisonment. Secondly, the Act also modifies the existing right of action in tort so that a whistleblower will now be able to take proceedings against a person who fails to comply with the confidentiality duty, seemingly now without any proof of loss. Up until now, breaches of confidentiality have only been actionable where the whistleblower suffers loss as a result of the breach. And the removal of this requirement to show loss will make it easier for a whistleblower to bring proceedings for breach. As a result, we would certainly expect that proceedings of this nature are likely to become much more common in practice. These two, two new measures will mean that whistleblowers will be more effectively able to enforce their right to confidentiality and that there will be far greater consequences for businesses and even potentially for individuals within businesses who get it wrong. But it's not all bad news for employers. The duty of confidentiality to the reporting person is not absolute. And just like under the pre-existing, the current regime, the Act does provide for a number of exceptions which businesses can rely on to legitimately disclose a whistleblower's identity. Now, the next slide here shows the most important two of these. The exceptions in the new Act replace the existing exemptions, which employers may be familiar with. They are broadly similar to the existing position, but even so, there are some important differences to be aware of. First, there will now be an obligation to obtain the explicit consent of the whistleblower prior to disclosing their identity other than in very limited circumstances. And this marks a tightening of the existing exception under the 2014 Act, which applied where it was reasonable to believe that the whistleblower did not object. The difficulty here is that, in many instances, if you go to the whistleblower and engage with them to obtain their, exp their explicit consent to a disclosure of their identity, this is very likely to prompt pushback and challenge. And this means that individuals within a business who are making a decision to disclose without the whistleblower's consent will need to ensure that they can stand over whatever exception is being relied on to avoid exposing the business to a claim for a breach of its duty of confidentiality. Now that said, the new legislation will provide important relief for employers by retaining scope for disclosure of the whistleblower's identity without consent where this is necessary for the effective investigation of the complaint. It provides that a person who receives a protected disclosure or a person to whom a protected disclosure is transmitted can disclose the whistleblower's identity to another person where they reasonably consider that this is necessary for the receipt, for the transmit, transmission, or to follow up on the report. In other words, for handling or investigating the report. However, I think this is likely to be strictly construed and given that there is now criminal liability at stake, it's something that employers should approach with caution. So far, we've been talking about protecting the identity of the whistleblower. But it's important not to forget that there's also another category of individuals who enjoy rights. And these are people who are mentioned in whistleblowing reports. The Act requires that employers' internal reporting channels for receiving reports must protect the identity of both the person who makes the report and any third party who's mentioned in the report. Because of this, businesses should design and operate their internal reporting channels in a way that protects the identity of other persons referred to in a protected disclosure 
as well as the identity of the reporting person. And more generally, it's advisable only to disclose information about any other individuals involved to broader stakeholders on a need to know basis. Another area that can be thorny for employers is managing anonymous protected disclosures. By their nature, these can create very real difficulties. They can be hard to investigate in practice and can come into conflict with an accused person's right to know their accuser. The new act addresses this issue and says three different things about anonymous disclosures. First, it provides that there is no obligation for employers to accept or to follow up on anonymous disclosures. Now, this is certainly a welcome development and that it will provide a measure of legal certainty for employers. However, I think it would be unwise to take too much comfort from it. It actually poses a potential trap for the unwary. The mere fact that there is no legal obligation to investigate an anonymous disclosure does not necessarily mean or translate into the fact that there could be no adverse consequences if a business or an organization chooses not to. A business that chooses not to investigate runs the risk of significant reputational harm if the matter becomes public. So this is a risk that will certainly need to be weighed carefully when you decide whether to investigate and if so, in what level of detail particularly if you're dealing with a disclosure that is serious and that is capable of being verified. Secondly, where employers do decide to accept anonymous disclosures, the new act provides that they must make information available to their workers, setting out the conditions on which they will be accepted and on which follow-up will be undertaken. This effectively means that any employer who is willing to accept an anonymous disclosure will have to address this issue in their policies and procedures which will bring a level of formality to the decision, limiting the ability of employers to decide purely on a case-by-case -case basis. Then finally, and fairly uncontroversially, the Act also provides that an individual who makes an anonymous disclosure and is subsequently identified and penalised for having done so is entitled to the same protection as any other worker who is penalised for making a protected disclosure. So what happens when employers fall foul of all these new requirements that we've been discussing? Well, as I alluded to earlier, the new legislation creates a number of new criminal offences, many of which attract very serious criminal sanctions, with fines of up to €250,000 and up to two years imprisonment for individuals. There are five new offences that are relevant to employers, as shown on this slide, and they include failing to comply with the requirement to establish, maintain and operate internal reporting channels and procedures, which Trina discussed, breaching the duty of confidentiality that I've just been speaking about, as well as penalizing or threatening penalization against a whistleblower. These new offenses are going to give the new legislation real teeth. It means that businesses and their boards will now need to guard not only against the civil ramifications of not complying with the new whistle regi whistleblowing regime, but also against the very real and serious criminal sanctions that could arise as well. Interestingly, the Act also creates an offence targeted at whistleblowers for the first time, that of knowingly reporting false information, as well as a right of action in tort for any person who suff suffers detriment as a consequence of the knowing report of false information. These measures might go some way towards deterring potential spurious disclosures but they are unlikely to provide any sort of panacea for employers that find themselves in this sort of predicament. It appears that there's going to be a requirement to prove the subjective knowledge of the worker, and this means that cases are likely to be quite rare in practice and only pursued in the most egregious of instances. Now, so far, we've been talking all about whistleblowing reports that are made to an employee's or a worker's employer. But workers can also qualify for protection by making disclosures external to their employers if they meet certain criteria. And this includes the making of protected disclosures publicly, for example, to the media. The new act amends certain of the criteria to qualify for protection in making an external disclosure to the media. And at least in some respects, there is something of a less uh, exacting standard now for the whistleblower to meet um, than there is under the current regime. For example, workers will now be able to do so in essentially any instance where they have reported a matter to their employer and their employer has failed to take appropriate action within the relevant time frame. The old requirement that reports to the media must not be made for personal gain has also been removed. 
In addition, workers can make external protective disclosures to what are known as prescribed persons. These are a broad range of bodies and offices performing public functions, such as the Corporate Enforcement Authority, the Data Protection Commission, the Director General, the Workplace Relations Commission, and multiple other regulators. The new act now requires all prescribed persons to have reporting channels and procedures in place to facilitate the making of external protected disclosures. These are broadly similar to the reporting channels and procedures which employers must operate, which Trina spoke about a little earlier. They include timeframes within which prescribed persons must follow up on disclosures that they receive, although they do afford an additional degree of flexibility to prescribed persons in certain circumstances, for example, where they receive considerable volumes of reports. Finally, the new legislation also provides for the establishment of a dedicated new Office of the Protected Disclosures Commissioner. This will serve as an additional external channel via which workers can make a protected disclosure, particularly where it is unclear who is the appropriate prescribed person to deal with a disclosure. The role of the commissioner will be to identify the appropriate prescribed person or another suitable person to address a disclosure that it receives and then transmit it to them to deal with in the ordinary way. Where the appropriate prescribed person or no other, sorry, where no appropriate prescribed person or no other suitable person can be found, the commissioner will serve as a prescribed person of last resort and must accept and investigate the disclosure itself. For this reason, the Act contains certain powers for the new commissioner, such as the power to compel records or enter premises and require information from persons found on the premises. This is to ensure that the commissioner has investigative tools at its disposal that are broadly equivalent to those available to prescribed persons who are tasked with investigating disclosures made to them. In practice, this new office is unlikely to move the dial hugely for employers. It will essentially be similar to another the other vast array of prescribed persons that already exist. So that's a brief overview of the main changes coming in the new Act. On that note, I'll hand back over to Lucia to kick off our Q&A to explore some of the questions that I can see have come through while we've been speaking. Thanks, Clara, and thank you to you all for, for that presentation. That was really good. Just before we go over to the questions, um, we have a few poll questions that we would love for you to answer. So the first one is, does your business currently have a whistleblowing policy in place? Uh, the answer is yes or no. So we will give you a few seconds to answer this question just by clicking on either yes or no. Um, so if you could do so, that would be great. Just a few more seconds and then I'll go to the results. Cool, perfect. I'll go to the results. So a lot answered yes. Um, I'm sure in the questions that we've had come through, we'll cover off uh, what this means as well um, for a lot of the companies. Uh, so over to the next poll question. Does your business currently have a designated internal reporting channel in place? Again, just simple yes or no answer. Give you a few seconds to answer that as well. Right, let's see what the results are on this one. Again, more answered yes than no. And then the final poll question before we go over to the Q&A is, have you ever had to deal with a whistleblowing complaint? So again, yes or no, and we'll give you a few seconds to answer this. Let's go over to the results. Okay, so more no on this one than yes. Um, okay, perfect. Well, we have had 
a lot of questions come in so we will try and get through as many as possible obviously we don't want to take up more of your time than than the full hour that we've got uh if we don't manage to get through to your question we will try in the coming weeks to answer individually um but let's kick start the uh questions now so the first question is um Obviously, during the presentation from you um, all, the, uh, the presentation provided details of the new Irish leg legislation with regard to internal reporting channels and procedures involving, for example, following up and providing feedback. So, Michael and Trina, I think this is one for you. Can you give more insights into the practical implications of these requirements regarding following up and providing feedback? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I suppose the starting point here is um, to maybe reflect on the current position under the Protective Disclosures Act 2014. Um, and, you know, somewhat unusually, um, there is actually no requirement under that act to take any action on foot of a whistleblowing complaint. So, strictly speaking, if a complaint landed on your desk and you didn't want to progress it, you could put it in the bin and that wouldn't be in breach of any statutory obligation. Wouldn't be advisable, obviously, but uh, it would be an option available to uh, an employer. Um, but as Trina's obviously outlined in, in her presentation, that's all about to change. Um, so under the, the new regime, and uh, you know, obviously this is when the act is formally commenced, which is, as I said, likely to be in the coming weeks, um, there's going to be a lot more positive obligations imposed on employers, in particular, the obligation to acknowledge receipt of a disclosure, and that has to be done within seven days. And then there's also the obligation to follow up on the disclosure. And in practical terms, in most cases, that's going to necessitate some kind of investigation. And then you have to go on further and provide feedback to the whistleblower within three months, or indeed uh, three month intervals thereafter until the follow up is concluded. And, you know, I suppose from our perspective, we think it'll be pretty straightforward, provided employers have policies in place to ensure that they do the acknowledgement piece, indeed even to do the investigation piece. Where the rubber is probably going to hit the tarmac is in engaging with the whistleblower and in particular, um, maybe at the end of an investigation, communicating with the whistleblower because our expectation is given whistleblowers are going to be a lot more involved now in these processes, it could be quite tricky to engage with them at the end of a process and say, you know, we've done our investigation, we're going to take further action, but we can't tell you about that for privacy reasons. And um, that's probably going to be pretty unsatisfactory from a whistleblower's perspective. And I think we can anticipate some, some pushback there if that's the position some employers adopt. And it will be the position some employers adopt, um, perhaps those who are you know risk adverse and in particular concerned about breaching data protection rights of other individuals individuals. Whereas on the other hand, there could be some employers who maybe are a little bit more risk tolerant and more conscious of the importance of closure for the person who's gone to the effort of actually making a report and the idea that really they should have some closure at the end of that process. And I think that, um, you know, perspective or viewpoint will probably inform the risk appetite uh, uh, of the particular employer. And indeed, they're thinking on how far they should go in, in providing feedback and, you know, full and frank feedback, perhaps at the end of their follow up. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be really important to manage the whistleblower's expectations. So it'll be important to strike that balance in the policy to make clear that, you know, feedback will be provided. That's the law. But it's equally important not to overcommit in terms of the extent or the type of feedback that's going to be given to the, the whistleblower. So it may be that a lot of employers will adopt a less is more approach in terms of the commitment that they give in terms of providing feedback. Perfect. Thank you, Michael and Trina. Um, so another question is that another challenging aspect in any investigation process is protecting the identity of the parties. So the new law appears to introduce a consequent requirement whereby it will generally be expected that the consent of the whistleblower to the disclosure of the, their identity will first be sought. Clara, I think this is one for you. What's your take on this requirement? Yeah, um, there is a general prohibition in the new legislation on disclosing the whistleblower's identity without their explicit consent. But there are a couple of exceptions where this duty does not apply at all, irrespective of the whistleblower's consent. And there's a consent override where the disclosure of the whistleblower's identity is reasonably considered necessary for the receipt, the transmission, or to follow up on the report. So I guess from an employer's perspective, the good news is that failure to obtain consent 
is not necessarily going to impede an employer's ability to proceed to investigate a complaint. So I guess if we take an example, if a whistleblower claims, for example, that they'd witnessed a fellow employee commit a fraud or, or something like that, and the employer is conducting an investigation into this allegation, in order to conduct a procedurally fair investigation from the perspective of the accused employee who obviously has constitutional rights and so on, which again, they're not absolute, but there, there are these rights, the employer would generally need to disclose who has made the very serious allegation against them in order to ensure that they can properly defend themselves. So the whistleblower withholding consent could not stop this if there is no other way to run an investigation that is pre procedurally fair. Mm -hmm. However, I think the difficulty is that even where you are justified in not seeking consent, if the whistleblower objects, this could have a real impact on your ability to actually progress the investigation. So for instance, maybe if you notify the whistleblower that you have identified them to the accused person to get their input and to relay their, you know, and, and then, you know, feed that back to the whistleblower for their comment, they could effectively pull up the drawbridge and refuse to cooperate further or, you know, threaten proceedings against you and so on. So you can hit a bit of an impasse. So there is risk with this and it is quite a big judgment call that you make if you're choosing to disclose without the consent of the whistleblower and to help manage that i think certainly it would be prudent you know if you're thinking of relying on this consent override to notify the whistleblower in advance so that you can gauge their reaction and react accordingly you know it's not a good idea to take them by surprise after the fact um and reveal that you have actually um disclosed their identity so I guess I'll wrap up now, but because I know there's a lot of other questions to get to, but while there is this consent override, it is an area where employers are going to need to tread like really very, very carefully. The override, the exceptions, they're narrowly framed. They're likely to be strictly construed. And, and you know, it's it's not example, it's, it's not clear whether, for example, if you, um, from the legislation, whether it would be permissible to disclose a whistleblower's identity maybe in a subsequent um, disciplinary process that follows an investigation, whether that's covered in the scope of ex um, whether that's covered in the scope of the exemption. So certainly one where you should tread with extreme care. Perfect. Thank you for that answer, um, Clara. So another question that does come up quite frequently is the use of centralised reporting channels. So, for example, a one stop shop via which all whistleblowing complaints are made, regardless of the country in which employees are employed. So the question to the panel um, is whether a centralised reporting channel can be used for workers in Ireland and what you were seeing in practice in this regard. So I'm not sure who wants to take this on first. I think I think that's one that all three of us have um, looked in detail at um, over the past while, because it's really one of, it's probably the number one query is with regard to the centralized uh, reporting channel. Um, so the basic rule is that each legal entity, and this is the rule under the directive, is that each legal entity which meets the threshold, and I saw a question coming in there about whether that's private sector or public sector, it'll be private sector. It will include both. Uh, so, uh, so private sector employers will, uh, who meet the thresholds will have to uh, have their own reporting channels. The rationale for having this needs must for having a local reporting channel uh, from the Commission is that channels must be easily accessible to the whistleblower, there must be information locally available to the whistleblower, whistleblower and they may have the right to request a physical meeting and so they'd have to have that fully. And uh, legal entities are, are uh, it, the directive encourages legal entities to open reporting channels to people who don't necessarily have like a, a close working relationship um, and aren't employees in the strict sense. So that they would all have access to a reporting channel. We have, uh, and we understand that uh, Denmark, in implementing its legislation, decided to allow for joint whistleblowing and centralised reporting themes, but doubts do remain about the consistency of that with the directive. Um, so, because strictly speaking, only having a centralised reporting channel at group level 
wouldn't be in compliance with the directive. Um, under the Irish legislation, and I think it's also in the directive, it does provide that, and it is worth noting that employers with less than 250 employees can share resources as regards the receipt of reports and any investigation to be carried out as part of the, um, the process of follow-up. So there is a limited scope there for resource sharing. Um, and I, I know, Clara, though, you've, you've looked at this uh, area in detail as well and advised on it. Yeah, um, I mean, you touched on the provision in the Act, which, which stems from one of the recitals ultimately in the directive that says that channels and procedures can be accessible by group workers. I guess the difficulty with that, uh, you know, a lot of people have kind of seized on it, but the difficulty is that it's it's permissive only. So it doesn't replace the strict requirement for all entities with 50 or more employees to have their own channels and for those with 250 above um, to do so as well. And without the, you know, the, the limited um, kind of relief to be able to share resources between entities um, that, that is available to smaller entities. So really what it does seem to be doing is allowing group companies to provide an additional group level channel as well as, but not instead of the kind of individual or the local channels. And obviously that's a that's a pretty impractical state of affairs for group entities with operations maybe across multiple EU jurisdictions or even with multiple entities within a single jurisdiction. Yeah, I mean, just to pitch in, um from my on the ground experience, I mean, we've been working with a lot of um, global banks uh, in recent weeks who have not only global policies, but also European policies and um, dealing with whistleblowing reports and, you know, a lot of debate with those clients about, well, do we need to have something separate, standalone for Ireland? Uh, and in those cases, they all had more than 250 employees uh, in Ireland. And where we kind of landed was, well, look, it is prudent to have a local reporting channel. It doesn't need to be as sophisticated as your your global or your central uh, European reporting line. You don't necessarily need to have a hotline. Um, you could designate somebody locally or a function locally as um, the designated recipient of local reports. Uh, and it would be prudent to set that out in a policy. And then really in your policy, um, really focus on promoting the central or the global reporting channel. So while you have the local channel as an addition or an extra option, it's clear, you know, from the user's reading of the policy that they're being encouraged or they're being directed uh, more towards the, uh, the, the the global or the European policy. And we got comfortable that that, um, that, that works and, and is compliant. I mean, you don't have to uh, exclusively use one channel over the other. If you're required to have a local channel, you can implement that, but also, I suppose, really promote your global or your European channel as your, your maybe your primary route through which uh, disclosures are made and, and processed. Cool, perfect. Thank you all for that answer. Um, we have a question that's in two parts. So first part being, which I think you have touched on um, in your answer so far, but do employers with 250 plus employees need whistleblowing policies? And the part two of this question is, what about employers with less than 250 employers? Okay, well, I'll take that. Um, well, I mean, the Act doesn't specifically state that employers have to have a policy, but what it does say is clear and easily accessible information on how reports can be made needs to be provided. And that's, you know, uh, certainly the case for employers with 250 employees plus once the Act uh, is commenced. So in practical terms, we're advising, well, the Act doesn't specify you need a policy, we say you do, um, because how else can you provide clear and easily accessible information? Uh, so certainly our guidance would be um, those employers who are going to be in the, uh, the, the net uh, who have 250 plus should really have a policy already, or if they don't, they should have one ready to go uh, in advance of enactment of the, uh, the Protective Disclosures uh, Act of 2022. For those with less than 250 employees, um, I mean, obviously that threshold is reducing to 50 employees uh, from December next year. So even if you decide right now, we're not going to implement a policy because we're not legally mandated to have one. If you have 50 plus employees, you'll have to have a policy next December. And of course, the carve out to that is if you're an employer, irrespective of your headcount in the financial services sector, you do need a policy. So uh, recently, I think it was about two weeks ago, we had a query from a, a UK client um, with a very small subsidiary 
five employees in Ireland, they were uh, subject to solvency too. And on that basis, we had to advise them that even though they only had five employees, they do actually need to have a policy ready to go once the uh, act is commenced. So, you know, there can be a trap there that some employers fall into where they're just looking at the headcount threshold and not necessarily assessing in particular of the financial services sector, whether or not they need to have a policy regardless of their headcount. Um, for those employers maybe who aren't in the financial services sector and have and will have less than 50 employees, well, there's no requirement to have a policy, but it is prudent. And, you know, I touched upon that in my um, presentation in terms of, you know, ensuring that if a disclosure is made um, that your, I suppose your management team are aware of the requirements. Uh, firstly, they're able to identify that a disclosure has been made, but also aware of um, what steps need to be taken to preserve the confidentiality of the person and indeed perhaps to investigate and ensure the person isn't penalised. So by not having a policy, you're, you're taking quite a lot of risk. Um, and, you know, I think that's probably um, excessive risk now that there's such a focus on whistleblowing and indeed you can anticipate a huge um, you know media storm over the next couple of months reporting on uh, I suppose the, the scope for individuals now to make reports and I think we can expect nearly in all our clients that over the next year or so it's quite likely their uh, whistleblowing mechanisms are going to be tested with reports coming forward and I can see from the poll um, the good news is a lot of people on the, the, the webinar today do have policies, but not that many of you yet have had to deal with yeah. whistleblowing reports. I suspect if we run this webinar next year, uh, those ratios will have changed quite significantly. Um, on the policy piece, if you do have a policy, it's really important that you bear in mind there's a lot of changes in the new Act. Um, in terms of definitions, in terms of what exactly is penalisation, the confidentiality piece. So don't assume that just because you have a policy that complies with the 2014 Act, that that's going to be fit for purpose for the 2022 Act. Our view is that while you might need to make wholesale changes, you certainly will need to make uh, you know, certain changes and, and, and certainly those employers who have to have now designated internal reporting channels, the 250 in the first wave, um, they'll have to make quite a lot of changes because they need to specify uh, all of the steps that they're going to take when a report is received in terms of the acknowledgement and the follow up and the feedback. So uh, I suppose key message today is for the 15% or so who don't have whistleblowing reports, really stress test whether you do need your whistleblowing policy and, and mechanism for making reports. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly would be recommending that um, you put it on your priority list, even if you're you're in that threshold of 50 to 250 and you have a little bit more time, maybe it's a 2023 priority. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, so actually one for, for, for Michael and Trina again, because you touched upon this. So you mentioned the expansion of examples of penalisation and a reversal of the burden of proof where an employee takes a claim in respect of penalisation. So what significance is this going to have for employers in defending employee claims under the Irish regime? Again, happy to take that one because um, it, it's something that, uh, you know, I'm quite critical of, I suppose, in terms of my commentary on the, the directive and the, I suppose, the requirements it now imposes on employers, which in many cases are very onerous. And this is just one example of that. Um, so I suppose once the act is commenced, if you're uh, subject to penalisation litigation, you're going to be obliged as an employer to prove a negative, which obviously can be difficult to do in practice. I mean, all an employee is going to have to do is make a disclosure point to some adverse treatment, say that that adverse treatment was because they made a disclosure, and then it's up to the employer to prove that that's not the case. Um, so to give you a very practical example, and one that is very likely to arise in, in, in the coming months is, you know, annual performance reviews. So we get to the end of the year, early next year, employers are doing their annual performance reviews. If somebody makes a disclosure in the weeks or months before their annual performance review, and they then get a negative rating, they can just assert that that negative rating has to be connected with their having made a disclosure. And then that's enough. They now have a prima facie penalisation claim. The burden shifts to the employer to prove that the negative performance rating wasn't in any way influenced by the fact that they'd made a disclosure. So, you know, sounds perhaps straightforward, but in practice, I think it won't be straightforward in that you're going to have to be able to show a lot of objective evidence to support the rating, and you're going to have to have very detailed records. Some employers do that when it comes to performance ratings, others don't. Um, but, you know, it's it's a classic example of the difficulties that can arise where someone can just make an assertion and then you as an employer have to prove a negative. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, in, in terms of mitigating the risk, it will be really important to ensure the confidentiality principle is respected. So therefore, only the minimum amount of people will know the identity of the whistleblower, and that will help employers guard against this risk. And then also, I suppose, if decisions are being taken in terms of uh, negative performance assessments or disciplinary sanctions in relation to other issues, that there is that objective evidence to support those decisions. If there's a medical referral, it is based on something completely outside of any protected disclosure. And so that they're in a position to justify their decisions if they are challenged. Cool, perfect. Thank you both. Um, we probably only have enough time for another two or three questions. Um, so, Clara, I'm going to hand over to you because I think this is one for you. So, you outline the process with regard to whistleblowers reporting externally. So, should businesses be concerned about whistleblowers going public? Yeah, I think to, to some extent, this is this is always a risk. It's probably a little bit more pronounced for organisations in the public sector, but it certainly does exist for private businesses too. Whistleblowers are entitled under the existing legislation and they're going to continue to be entitled under the new legislation to go to the media in a number of circumstances. And these include where there's a risk of penalization if they disclose internally or where they have already made a disclosure internally but appropriate action wasn't taken within the relevant time frame by their employer. I'm sure we've all seen, you know, the types of exposés where a whistleblower has made a complaint that wasn't investigated or that wasn't investigated properly, and then they become disgruntled and they head off to the papers or to whoever else. In addition to all of the other legal risks under the new regime, this is the reputational risk that you take if you don't comply uh, and if you don't investigate and if you don't sort of bring the whistleblower along with you on the journey so that they know that you are taking their complaint seriously. What I would say, though, is that there are steps that businesses can take to mitigate this risk. The first one is to ensure, you know, obviously, this isn't rocket science, that you are complying with your legal obligations to the whistleblower so that you don't give them any reason to want to escalate the matter externally. You're legally obliged to do this anyway. So it's, it's you know, in some sense, it's a no-brainer. And then secondly, I think it's about sort of ensuring that you have a positive whistleblowing culture so that it's not just box ticking and whistleblowers do feel that they can speak up internally, that their concerns will be heeded and that they won't end up being penalized. Just a final point um, and then maybe squeeze in another question or two. Uh, It's just that, you know, a lot of what I've said here about the media or public disclosures, it applies equally to external disclosures to prescribed persons or to regulators. So for employers that don't get it right here, there is scope to find yourself on the wrong side of an investigation by a regulator or an enforcement agency if the whistleblower goes off to them. So it's really not a place that you want to find yourself in. It could be very, very damaging reputationally, financially, and and so on. So you certainly want to do everything that you can to avoid that. Thank you, Clara. Um, So I think we only have enough time for one more question. There has been loads and loads of questions. So sorry that we haven't been able to get around to everyone's. Um, But like I said, we will try in the coming weeks to answer your questions individually. So for the last question, I think, Trina, this will be one for you. So is a UK company with employees in Ireland obliged to comply with the Act? Because we do have both uh, Irish and UK companies on this webinar today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, any employer employing people in Ireland will be affected by the new legislation and will have to comply with the new legislation. So the Act applies to all employees um, who are habitually working in Ireland and they can invoke the protections of the Act though in respect of the new definition of penalisation and the new regime. In terms of looking at whether you meet the headcount for the threshold, This would again involve, well, do you have employees who are entitled to the protection of the Irish um, Protected Disclosures Act? So it's usually assessed on the basis of whether they habitually work in Ireland. However, under the Irish Act, it is worth noting that there is a provision saying that the minister may, for the purpose of the calculation of the number of employees an employer has, that he may by regulation provide for methods to be applied by such employers in respect of these employees. So watch this space because there could be ministerial regulation dictating how employers should calculate their headcount. 
Perfect. Thank you for that. So unfortunately, we have we will have to uh, end the Q&A session there. But thank you, Michael, Trina and Clara for your presentation and all the answers to those questions. I'm sure we could go on for hours with all the questions we've got. But unfortunately, we do only have uh, the hour. But just wanted to point out to the uh, audience members that are still on that we do have a white paper specific to this Irish transposition um, that ANL Good Body have participated in um, and contributed quite a lot of information to. So that is highlighted in the resource section that should be highlighted on your screen um, right now. Also, um, when we finish, there's a really, really short survey um, that we'd love for you to complete. It will take about 20 seconds, and it's just so we can continuously provide you with informative and uh, value-adding um, webinars. But again, thank you to the speakers, and thank you for the audience participation, um, and everyone have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.